Probably here is the first message. We need to differentiate between the large normal population of women who've got polycystic ovaries, which is about 20% of the female population, and ladies with polycystic ovarian syndrome, because they are two different categories and they have different issues. So PCOS is the commonest endocrine disorder in females. It reflects with unexplained hyperandrogenism and chronic anovulation, and it's the anovulation part of it, which is the difference between the PCO and the PCOS. 10 to 12% of our female population in the fertile age group, three quarters anovulatory, 40% high BMIs, 90% hirsute. Polycystic ovaries, generally 20% of the women, no clinical manifestation and no effect on fertility. And this is very much where I would urge you to support us in making sure that the 20 year old who has regular cycles, who goes for a scan for a different reason, the scanner tell her you have polycystic ovaries, she goes on the net, she panics, she comes running to you. That group of ladies don't have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Their long and short term outcome is absolutely normal and should be just reassured. Also, the plea to our people who scan is to make a proper diagnosis because a young multifollicular healthy ovary is not a polycystic ovary. <coughs> there is no link between PCO and ethnicity. PCOS, as John mentioned, very heterogeneous. Menstrual irregularities, mostly oligo and amenorrhea. They're more hirsute with acne and come saying that they're losing their hair. <coughs> and it has a characteristic appearance on ultrasound. Uh, again, uh, for people who scan, uh, particularly the radiographers, they need to stick to the BFS Ashley <coughs> consensus on how to make the diagnosis. From your perspective, these ladies will have a high serum concentration of LH and androgens. This is the uh, normal ovary and the polycystic ovary. And on ultrasound, this is the typical pearl string appearance with the thicker, brighter stroma. Polycystic ovaries will develop as an anovulation persists for a length of time. And it will lead to increased estrogen and that's very much how our two talks relate. These women produce more and more estrogen which is put them at risk of irregular bleeding and of endometrial hyperplasia and endometrial cancer. They've got raised androgen, LH and testosterone. There is a 50% reduction in serum binding globulin. Their FSH is low due to the negative feedback from the raised <coughs> estrogen, but not totally depressed. So very much, again, our younger population who tell you I get three periods a year and they think they cannot ovulate and cannot get pregnant and from a practical point of view rely on their PCOS for contraception. That group of ladies need to be told very clearly that they cannot do that because they are not infertile. Many of them don't mature enough to ovulate and the follicles are surrounded by hyperplastic theca due to the high LH levels. I'm gonna try and skip through some of this to um, catch up on time. <laughs> the role of insulin has also uh, been uh, very well studied uh, in women with PCOS. Many more of them are insulin resistant. And uh, the insulin resistance is a common pathological state, as you know, with the target cell failing to respond to the <coughs> ordinary levels. There is increased incidence of non-insulin dependent diabetics, up to 40% of the ladies with polycystic ovarian syndrome are either glucose intolerant or diabetic. This is also relevant when they become pregnant because these women 
pregnancy care and pregnancy outcome is actually different from the normal uh, polycystic ovaries or the normal ladies. Hyperinsulinemia does cause hyperandrogenism, and there's been a fair bit of work now which has evidenced all of this. Metformin, as you will know, increases the hepatic glucose production and decreases uptake. This is the PCOS, the normal cell with a normal number of receptor sites. When they're insulin resistant, their quarter of the cell receptors are there. Can metformin restore ovulation? The answer is yes. It does restore regular menstrual cycle and ovulation in up to 96% of the ladies. It's not shown to be teratogenic, so it's safe enough to continue in early pregnancy. There is some ongoing studies to see if there is evidence that it reduces miscarriage rate. It does improve on ovulatory function in half the women, and it decreases androgens. <laughs> it improves, obviously, on glucose tolerance and hyperinsulinemia. We know that hyperinsulinemia now plays a major role in PCOS. And again, quite a lot of work is still ongoing as to the true benefit for short-term and long-term use of metformin and insulin sensitizing agents. Again, going back, and uh, our talks here uh, cover the same topic a bit, PCOS is being associated with increased, women have increased risk of hypertension cardiovascular disease, hyperandrogenism, but more so endometrial cancer, and the data suggest a 5.7% increase. So it's quite relevant. <coughs> Treatment, the most important is weight loss in these ladies. Weight loss by lifestyle measure is very important, and lots of work has been done by Steve Franks and Adam Balen about how to best help these ladies lose the weight. The addition of early start is very helpful. Magical treatment, if they just want help with their skin, Xenorit and Vanica. The pill works very well, and again, Sally mentioned particularly Diana and Yasmin. Metformin. And then we come to a little bit of how do we help them to get pregnant. Clomid is the gold standard as we speak low-dose gonadotrophins, and last but not least, surgical treatment. <coughs> now, talking about weight loss, a lot of evidence that if we make them actually lose 10% of their body weight, they will improve on both their reproductive function and their long-term outcomes. Weight loss needs to be by both caloric intake down to as little as 500 calories a day, reducing carbohydrate, increasing exercise, the only appetite suppressant at the moment, or not appetite suppressant for that reason, is early start. Uh, reduction has now been removed of the market. Both early start and metformin are quite effective in reducing hyperandrogenemia as long as the ladies lose the weight. We're gonna talk a little bit about the effect on fertility and how do we manage that in primary and secondary care. I think foundation, proper diagnosis, and the diagnosis is made on both <coughs> ultrasound and biochemical. Clomid works very well, and Clomid at a dose of 50 milligram from the second day of their period, otherwise a progesterone withdrawal. Day two to day six, and they ovulate and they're pregnant, and the ovulation rate is up to 50 to 60%. They conceive, they're happy, they're not conceiving, then you can, if there are no other factors, and they've had the tubal patency test, try Clomid and intrauterine insemination. If Clomid doesn't work, there is no evidence of ovulation, you can try a combination of Clomid and metformin, particularly in the ladies with a BMI of over 25, laparoscopic ovarian drilling, and gonadotrophins. I'm going to talk for a few minutes on laparoscopic ovarian drilling. It's been described as back as 1984. Different modalities were used to uh, do the drill, 
and the, the drill technique itself has been modified to make it the safest we can do. It's not a first-line treatment for uh, PCO and anovulatory subfertility. It's a second-line treatment when they fail to respond to clomid. The, at the moment, the safest that we know of technique is actually using a very fine diathermy point, and it creates four diathermy points on the ovary, and ideally two anterior surface and two posterior surface, and we do that with cooling to reduce any adhesion formation. Okay, there's a lot of evidence that it works with very uh, respectable 82% ovulation, 63% conceived. The predictive factor of how will it work is the duration of infertility, how do we do it, and their preoperative LH level. The other thing it's useful at, it <coughs> makes the women more responsive to clomid or gonadotrophin treatment. It does regulate their cycle, and it improves their hirsutism and acne. It is not promoted for, for just hirsutism and acne. So we shouldn't really be doing ovarian drilling only for hirsutism and acne that can be treated medically. Advantages, it's one of procedures, so it's on the whole cost saving. <coughs> there is no risk of ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome and multiple pregnancy, because normally they have a unifollicular development and a, a singleton pregnancy. There is no intensive monitoring required. There's a fall in the rate of miscarriage. And if it doesn't succeed on itself, it makes them more susceptible to clomid again. Disadvantages, and this is where <coughs> we need to be wary that nothing is 100% safe. Adhesion formation, particularly in the old days, when people hadn't worked out exactly how many drills they needed to do, uh, and uh, didn't use the techniques as we are now prescribing and doing. In some women, it actually has led to premature <coughs> ovarian failure, and there is an ongoing <coughs> AMH study to look at the effect and the safety. Okay, AMH is produced by the granulosa cell and represents, quote, the pool of follicles the women have. Having said that, women with PCOS have a much higher AMH, and the higher their AMH is, the less they respond to treatment. So there is a lot of work around PCOS and AMH at the moment. Uh, it also will give us some more information about the effect of uh, ovarian drilling. So we are dealing with the ladies who are a lot more of high BMI, who carry also higher anesthetic and surgical risk, and we need to be mindful of that. In conclusion, there is insufficient evidence as we speak today that either laparoscopic drain or medical treatment, one is superior to the other. So we owe it to our patient to try medical treatment first. If it doesn't, then we move on to surgical. Potential advantages, as I said a minute ago, and long-term benefit and disadvantages are still being looked at. So in conclusion for that part of it, we're going to slim them all down, then all you have to treat. It will reduce their symptoms. It will improve their fertility. And on the, on the short and the long term, it will reduce their risk of abnormal bleeding. It will risk, reduce their risk of endometrial cancer, and so on and so forth. I'm going to talk for a minute or two about PCO and endometriosis because 16.5% of our patients with PCOS also have endometriosis, and that's the group of ladies who will come to you and complain of both their irregular period but also their pain. Okay? Often enough, that's because they've got the two together. Laparoscopy gives us the opportunity to truly identify endometriosis and treat it. And there is no role for medical treatment of endometriosis with the pill or <coughs> myrenas or cyclogest or anything if they're trying for a baby. The only group where there is evidence medical treatment works is actually women with very severe endometriosis going through an IVF 
program where the group of ladies are getting prolonged down regulation prior to their IVF treatment cycle, and that's the only group where magical treatment does work. Last but not least, two words about assisted conception if everything else fails, or there are other contributory factors like male factors of fertility. So these are my first set of quads, and indeed the first set of quads in the Northern Hemisphere, who are 30 this year. And we're very proud of them. There were actually three embryo transfers and not four. And you know, three or four embryo transfers are something of the past in this country because of the risk. We can be very lucky and have four healthy children, but that's not the norm. So going forward through the years, we've improved on our ability to try and quantify the dosages of the treatments we give so that we can give the least amount of gonadotrophin and get good outcomes. This in line reduces risk and cost. And we're still a little bit struggling with the women who are what's called the poor super ovulators. We're improving our techniques by doing assisted hatching in a group of women who are a little older, their FSH is a bit higher, they've had implantation failures. We're replacing a lot more blastocysts because our culture media have improved and we can do that safely by replacing blastocysts. We are doing a little bit more than normal morph of what happens in natural life and hence gives us better outcomes. And again, this is the evidence behind it where there is a lot of work to show that if we can replace good blastocysts, the likelihood is we can replace less embryos, improve pregnancy rates, and reduce multiple pregnancies. That's the Cochrane data review. For some time, IVF was multiple pregnancy equated to what the doctor has done to you, okay? Uh, and we've been able to reduce that satisfactorily through the years. We're putting mostly a single uh, blastocyst now. The Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority uh, started the one at a time philosophy back in January 2009. And initially that was for what was called the grade one patients, which are the younger first cycle. We went on to the extended embryo culture program, five or more embryos and grade ones. We put back one embryo and we freeze the rest. So, We've gone a long way. We're able to offer so much more to our patients, but we need to be very careful that not everything comes without any risk. So we're ovulation induction. We're doing a lot of fertility restoring surgery and assisted reproduction, and that's the outcome. A lot more happier singletons, healthy baby to healthy families. Thank you very much indeed.